Hi, this is Mr Evans. This video looks at how to become a flexible organisation and I'm going to go through these first four bullet points here um, uh, in the specification. So I've defined in a previous video that a flexible organisation is one that's able to anticipate changes and respond to those changes quickly. So how does an organisation do this? Well, it's mostly um, about uh, becoming a flatter organisation. Okay, so we are focusing, so you need to uh, be aware of from uh, unit 3.6, the differences between a tool and a flat hierarchy. Arguably, flatter hierarchies are far more responsive to change than tool hierarchies that rely on, um, you know, command from the top and, and quite a lot of rigidity. A flat hierarchy, the theory goes, means that um, authority is delegated to those on the uh, lower levels who are closer to customers and more aware of changes that are happening in the external environment. Maybe if it's an internationalised business, they're more aware than the head office of changes that are going on in, uh, in their particular corner of the world. And therefore, they'll be able to make more effective decisions and so they should have the power to do that. So there's a few um, ways that that's happened. So delayering is uh, where we get rid of layers of management. We move from a tool to a flatter hierarchy. We delegate more decision making power to those people at the bottom of the hierarchy. An organic structure is another word for a flat structure where um, you know decision making can be made organically at the bottom level in response to changes in the environment whereas a mechanistic structure is more tightly controlled and would typically be a taller structure so these two points here on the specification are really referring to the same things um, organic uh, mechanistic delayering we're trying to get to that flat responsive hierarchy in terms of restructuring an organization um, in sort of the uh, 80s, 90s, there was, a, a, you know, organisations had got very big. I mean, I'm, I'm talking generally here, but um, many organisations had got very big. Um, and for example, with schools, um, a lot of schools employed cleaners, uh, the canteen staff, when really the core business of a school is teaching and equally businesses were employing cleaners, uh, canteen staff and there was a refocusing uh, in the 1990s on focusing on the core competences. What are we really good at and what can we uh, kind of and, and, and how can we focus on that more and allow other organisations that specialise in these other areas to focus on our non-core activities. So this is related to um, Charles Handy and his work on the Shamrock organisation. I've actually represented it more of kind of a target because I think it makes more sense. Um, in the middle of the target, we've got the core workers. These are the full time employees who have the essential skills that a business requires uh, to operate. They're the ones who are um, you know, the, the people who have the skills that generate that business's core competence. In terms of a school, those people would probably be the teachers. These are the core workers with the essential skills. The output of a school is education. And so the teachers are the core workers because they're the ones who are interacting um, with the students. There are, of course, other core workers in a school. We need to have finance people to manage the money. Um, uh, and we need to have uh, the leadership but essentially the core, core workers are those who are involved in delivering the product and generating an organisation's USP. We then might have flexible workers. Okay, So in terms of a school, that might be the substitute teacher who comes in when people are sick or is able to cover when people are on trips, etc. Or in a <clears throat> supermarket, it might be a student who is working part time in order to cover the temporary hours or some of the workers that are employed in the run up to Christmas when supermarkets get very busy. These are the flexible workers, not part of the core staff, but they help the organisation respond to things like busy times or um, uh, non-standard orders. Whereas peripheral workers tend to have been outsourced. Now, uh, these, these peripheral workers may not be employed by the company anymore. In fact, often they're not. 
So in fact, if you look at the cleaning staff in your school or the canteen staff in your school, there's a, there's, a, there's a relatively high chance that they might not be school employees. They might belong to a particular catering company that's separate or a separate cleaning company. If you've got your staff and your your cleaning staff and your canteen staff employed by the school, it's actually quite unusual these days. Um, because organisations have decided to focus on their core competence and kind of subcontract out to peripheral workers' non-core activities. So um, I've got a couple of friends uh, who do some um, subcontracting for banks. They, they both work in kind of digital technology. Now, they're not employed, employed part-time, full-time, sorry, by banks, but they're often employed on six-month contracts to help a bank with a particular project. The bank doesn't consider it part of its core business, but they want that person's skills, and so they employ them on a part-time basis. Uh, um, sorry, they employ them on a subcontractor's contract, you know, to do a specific piece of work. So the core workers... Um, would tend to be employed by the school. Flexible workers may be employed by the company, the school, or they may be, in fact, be employed by kind of a uh, temping agency or something like that. Um, and the peripheral workers don't actually work for the company, but they perform important services for the school but it, or the business, but it's been outsourced. Um, the other thing that you need to be aware of is flexible uh, employment contracts. So we'll just have a quick look at them here. So flexible employment contracts include part-time staff, temporary and seasonal staff. Now this is part of unit 3.6. You need to be aware of the benefits and costs of using those. Zero hour contracts is a very interesting uh, area. Um, zero hour contracts are where Businesses require employees to be available to work for them, but in fact may not have any hours for them to work. Um, now this can work quite well for some uh, workers, like students might like a zero hours contract, um, but if you are dependent on that work and there's a chance that the business could call you and say, well, you're ready to work, but we don't actually want you, that can be very bad for people. So there's quite a lot of going on in the news in the media about zero hours contracts and their impact. Working flexi time, uh, that's something that I used to do when I worked for an insurance company. You know, there were core hours that I had to be in for between 10 and 4, um, and I had to complete a certain number of hours a day. I think it was 9, but I could arrive at, say, 8 and leave at 4, or I could arrive at 10 and leave at 6. So um, there is some flexibility. And my brother um, had a job up until recently where he could work one day. A week from home and as long as he was on his email uh, his employer was perfectly happy with that um, and just helps an organization to be a bit more flexible and you know things like working from home can enable uh, maybe young um, mothers or fathers to be to keep working for a company maybe they'd have to stop working if they weren't allowed to work from home a couple of days a week um, or something like that so these enable a business to change um, and be flexible in order to basically uh, meet demand and the changing external environment.